Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. It was a tumultuous weekend for the Assembly of First Nations. Late on Friday, the AFM put out a statement saying that National Chief Roseanne Archibald was suspended immediately with pay for breaching her obligations and to the political organization. While the AFN says that Archibald will remain suspended pending the outcome of an investigation into four complaints against her. Archibald, who says she found out about the suspension through media reports, has been firing back via social media posts all weekend. She says the suspension is an attempt to silence her for, quote, speaking her truth about the ongoing misconduct at the AFN. Her work phone and email have been disabled, according to one statement, and Archibald says it amounts to a, quote, staged coup by regional chiefs. The AFN says Archibald is also barred from attending the annual General Assembly in Vancouver that's just two weeks away. You can find much more on this story on our website, aptnnews.ca. Well, it's a major step toward justice for offers of Indigenous children taken from their families and placed in non-Indigenous care during the Millennium Scoop. The federal court approved a class action lawsuit against the government of Canada today. Lawyers for families and children taken between 1992 and 2019 announced that the class action will continue. It will cover status and non-status Indigenous families living off reserve. Cheyenne Stonechild, the lead representative plaintiff, says she spent just one day with family since she was taken at age eight. It feels incredibly surreal to be here. And I have to say, I'm very humbled by this decision. As foster kids, we don't usually get very many breaks in life, but this really feels like one. And finally, I feel validated. I'm a young Cree woman and a survivor of what has been called the millennial scoop. Authorities removed me from my mother when I was eight years old, and I spent the rest of my childhood tossed between at least 15 different foster homes and group homes. I spent precisely one day with someone from my family group. No one wants to be a statistic, but those of us who become that, that statistic don't usually have a say. Those claims have not been proven in court. The federal government reached a $40 billion agreement in principle for on-reserve youth and their families last year. Well, to be seen now where a mother is making a desperate plea for any information on the whereabouts of her 20-year-old daughter. APTN's Tina House has that. She's in trouble. I know that. That's the feeling I have. I have a feeling my daughter's in trouble. Um, it is not just her playing hide-and-seek. It's not her avoiding anyone. If she struggles, she just calls out to close a missing person. It's that simple. But my child has money in the bank. So it's been sitting there. Natasha Harrison is worried for the safety of her daughter, Tatiana Harrison. The 20-year-old was last seen on surveillance video from this Royal Bank, located in Vancouver's downtown east side on Maiden Hastings. On March the 23rd, she can be seen entering the bank and withdrawing money. And since then, her bank account has not had any activity. Well, it's the last image on camera. Natasha but, says uh, she I encountered red tape that prevented Vancouver after. police from actually beginning to start the search because her last known residence was in Surrey. And they pushed the file over to Surrey. I fought with them the whole time and it was 20 days to 22 days that it was with Surrey the whole time me fighting and it took 20 days for them to check that camera on Maine and Hastings. And they told me they pushed it because of jurisdiction because she last resided in Surrey but I want to know how, why it took them that long to check that camera. Since her daughter's disappearance, Natasha has been searching every day, trying to find answers. Excuse me. Hi. I'm actually looking for my daughter. I was wondering if you guys have seen her around here. Her name's Tatiana. She's 20 years old. Here, I'll, do you want, you want to take one? I'll give that to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'll take one. Yeah, no, sorry. I mean, yeah, I've seen her. But, yeah. Um. But despite people having said they have seen her, Everyone has said they haven't seen her in over a month. So for Natasha, it's another dead end. But she is determined to talk to anyone and utilizing all her resources she has to find Tatiana. Butterflies and Spirit have also joined in the search after Vancouver police asked them to help. VPD also printed the 500 posters being put up today. They were concerned because there was no action on her bank account. 
and they had footage and or pictures of her last known whereabouts, which, or the last place she was caught on camera, was at a Royal Bank. And there's a person with her in that video. Vancouver police have released this image of a man in the Royal Bank with Tatiana that day. They are asking him to come forward if he has any information about Tatiana. They also released this statement and how her file was handled. Initial findings from the investigation indicated that Tatiana was last seen in Surrey. As such, Surrey RCMP assumed conduct of the investigation. When investigators discovered evidence that Tatiana had used a bank machine in Vancouver at the end of March, Vancouver police took over the investigation and has continued to gather evidence. This is an active and ongoing investigation. We are concerned for Tatiana's safety. This is her favorite hair color. She'll always revert back to the auburn. And yeah, this is, that's my daughter. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Tatiana Harrison, you are asked to call the police. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. The first regional First Nations Economic Circle in Quebec drew in hundreds of people for two days of panels and announcements for economic engagement. Amelia Fournier has more. On a encore, nous, des ambitions de développement là, euh, sur le plan énergétique. Puis on a justement convenu, pas plus tard qu'hier, qu'on va faire front commun pour le développement de l'énergie communautaire. The chief of Pequa Gal Minouets, Gilbert Dominique, hosted Saguenay Lac Saint Jean's Economic Circle in Mastroyash, two and a half hours north of Quebec City. He said that industry is finally recognizing the importance of First Nations. Ben, moi, je pense que ce qui, ils peuvent se compter chanceux que pendant des générations et générations, ils n'ont pas, dû, ils ont pas dû, dû, euh, eu, la, eu à le faire. Les institutions de financement autochtones sont une, une option disponible. The Regional Economic Circle, held in Mastroyash, Quebec, was well attended by the business community. Indigenous and business leaders alike say this is a step towards economic reconciliation. But ultimately, what we're wanting to achieve is that there's a sustained effort in order for our communities to have the same economic uh, opportunities than those municipalities around them. Panels attended by over 260 people discuss financing tools, indigenous title, business relationships and more. Le développement justement de partenariats des Premières Nations. Hydro Quebec promised funds for indigenous women entrepreneurs. Tinish Kumit now, Newt and Rio Tinto, a mining company that destroyed an ancient indigenous site in Australia without permission of the landholders, announced an indigenous awareness program for their employees. But there are still tensions to solve. On veut s'assurer que les industries euh, qui œuvrent dans le milieu forestier développent des partenariats et des ententes avec les Premières Nations, particulièrement la nôtre, OK? Parce que ça va permettre, là, bien sûr, là, d'atteindre un certain niveau d'acceptabilité sociale. At Sikamak Nation, Grand Chief Constant Awashish said Quebec could do more to ensure this social acceptability. Je pense que c'est important au gouvernement de reconnaître ces droits-là, de les respecter et euh, de trouver une façon d'harmoniser nos besoins et leurs besoins, puis de ne pas de, 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 de respecter les besoins de chacun. Je pense que c'est comme ça que le gouvernement doit se comporter et non toujours en ignorant ou en éludant la question autochtone ou en contournant la question autochtone. Ça soit pas une journée, deux journées, mais qu'on continue de s'engager. The provincial indigenous affairs minister said Quebec is developing agreements to reinforce these rights. Too often we do those events and there's no follow-up, so people you know, they lose faith. They say, okay, we've done the marvelous meeting, but what's going to happen next? Yes, there will be a follow-up. Yes, there will be numerous like uh, regional circle like this one. The next regional economic circle will be held in Val d'Or, Quebec, in November. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Mastroyash, Quebec. We want to hear what you think about the state of Indigenous economy, where you live. Is it growing? Is it thriving? Is it facing challenges? You can tell us. Here's how. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. You can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see all of our latest stories. A government-run shelter for people in need in Whitehorse will soon be under First Nations management. 
The Council of Yukon First Nations and nonprofit organization uh, Connective uh, will take over operation of the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter from the Yukon government in October. The change is not going to affect the day-to-day -day services at the shelter. Plans have been underway since 2019 to hand over the shelter to a non-government partner. The council's executive director says a high number of shelter users are Indigenous and the takeover will ensure that vulnerable clients receive culturally appropriate care. It was really important for us to um, uh, apply to this partnership so Yukon First Nations could have a say in the management and oversight of the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter. We need to take a break, but coming up, a bombshell investigation by APTN into an RCMP unit that watches land defender movements in BC. Stay with us. of the Community Industry Response Group. Well, last week, APTM reporter Brett Forrester published a sweeping investigation into this special unit of the RCMP in British Columbia. He uncovered numerous allegations following the group just about everywhere it goes. For more, Brett joins us now from Ottawa. Brett, you know, first of all, what made you decide to uh, put this RCMP, this particular squad, uh, into the, fo the focus of such an extensive investigation? Well, this unit, the Community Industry Response Group, has been involved in a number of high-profile operations. They've been in a, uh, engaged in enforcing an injunction on Wet'suwet'en territory that has manifested in three militarized raids on uh, largely non-violent activists who had set up an occupation there. But the unit's also been responsible for uh, enforcing an injunction on Ferry Creek, uh, which um, later, in terms of arrests, ended up being one of the largest acts of civil disobedience in the country. Uh, and it's also been involved in protecting the Trans Mountain Pipeline uh, from uh, the Tiny House Warriors Camp and involved in operations uh, against that occupation in the province's interior. Um, so it's been involved in a wide variety of activities, but very little information is actually available publicly. I think the BC RCMP website has about three lines. Uh, so it's hard to find out why this unit was established, how it operates, and who these Mounties are. And those are the questions that I set out to answer with this investigation. Well, um, for those who haven't read the story, give us a little, uh, the highlights. Uh, what came to light as the story progressed about this unit? Well, number one, it was established in 2017, early 2017. Uh, a bunch of senior Mounties got together and created this unit specifically to protect the province's major resource extraction projects from mainly Indigenous-led resistance. And these were the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline and the Coastal Gas Link pipelines. Um, the two senior commanders uh, anticipated protests and resistance to these projects, and they um, created this special unit to specifically uh, prepare for and eventually respond. Um, so that's why it was created. Uh, another uh, thing I learned was that this unit operates quite closely, uh, as one activist put it, hand in glove uh, with private security agents from petroleum firms and other corporate uh, security interests, or corporate uh, industry interests. So there's actually a broadening network of senior ex-Mounties who operate uh, in, in, and often have colluded uh, with, with Mounties on the current, on the force right now to infiltrate protest camps. Uh, they helped a spy hired by Teal Jones infiltrate the Ferry Creek camps. Uh, the Mounties filed an affidavit written by a former cop working for Coastal Gas Link uh, in court. And so that's another thing I uh, found out. And finally, thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, there's a number of allegations that basically follow this unit wherever it goes, whether it be uh, in the interior, uh, for TMX, CGL, or down in Ferry Creek, the same stories, uh, the same allegations crop up, and they are the allegations of uh, heavy-handedness, excessive use of force, uh, colonialism, and in Ferry Creek, this is manifested in a court case where 121 people are um, going to court, uh, essentially alleging that this unit uh, engaged in a systematic campaign of fear and violence that was, quote-unquote, so shocking, uh, the courts only 
course of action is to throw out the charges to save its own reputation. Now, the allegations haven't been proven, uh, but they will be tested, and then eventually a judge will decide uh, whether or not to condone the alleged behavior of this group. So you take all of this, you know, the, you know, the, the RCMP connection to the, to the securities, uh, all of these other allegations, you go to the RCMP in BC to the commanders, what's their response to it? Well, that's another interesting part of the investigation is that it is not easy to get accurate information about the RCMP from the RCMP. One of the things they frequently do is monitor media coverage. They're known for restricting journalists' access to active injunction zones through uh, exclusion zones, which a court has already deemed to be illegal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I requested an, inter an interview with the BC RCMP commanders about two weeks ago, almost now, and nobody was made available. Uh, I do have an interview scheduled with the commander, the gold commander of this unit later this week, so I'll be interested to hear what he says. Uh, but it's forced me to take other routes, and one thing I did to uncover were a series of allegations filed by the gold commander, Superintendent John Brewer, who defended the unit's actions at Ferry Creek, which can also kind of help, uh, you know, explain or justify uh, their operations elsewhere because they use the same tactics. And essentially, to boil it down, their argument is that this unit has been compelled by the courts to engage in some of the most complicated policing operations in the country and they've done so more than a thousand uh, arrests and so on with only a few minor injuries uh, and they've been you know forced into unorthodox methods and occasionally risky methods by what they describe as a sophisticated series of illegal blockades um, and in terms of justifying their existence their argument is that uh, this group would have expertise in indigenous cultural protocols, uh, injunction law, and other things that uh, have led to really botched police responses in the past at places like Ipperwash and Oka. Um, you know, the people I talk to on the ground don't necessarily buy those justifications. But again, it'll be interesting to see what the court has to say about it. Well, this is just the beginning of this investigation for you. Uh, we're going to watch aptnnews.ca to see the, all the follow-ups. Brett, kudos to you. This was incredible journalism. Super proud that you are here with APTN breaking stories like this. Thanks for having me. We need to take another break, but still ahead. Treaty days are back in many communities in person. We're going to visit one when we return. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Spring brings the blooming flowers, and Irene Lattery has this great shot of an Alberta wild rose in the Grand Prairie, Alberta area. It's getting ready to open up there. Thank you for this, Irene. If you have a great photo, email it to us at share at aptn.ca. You might be our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. To the east coast, we got showers in 21 for St. John, 17 in cloud for Halifax. Kujuak, sunny and 19 degrees in Ukshuak, mix of sun and cloud, 21. 14 for Sedils and showers, 14 and a mix of sun and cloud in Gaspé. Ottawa, 16 and showers, Windsor, 21, you're gotten rain there too. 19 and sunshine for Capus Casing and Big Trout Lake. 20 and showers for Norway House, Puckettawag and sunshine and 22, same with you over in Thompson. 21 and showers for Winnipeg, 25 and showers for Dauphin. Estevan, 20 and rain, 21 for North Battleford and Saskatoon with a chance of showers there too. Cloud continues to the north, 20 and maybe some showers for Buffalo Narrows, 23 and showers for LaRange. Only sunny places, Peace River at 22. Fort McMurray, you're getting showers, 25 degrees expected there. 22 and sunny for Lethbridge, 22 and cloud for Medicine Hat. Quinnell, 17 and rain, Tofino, 14 and showers there. 23 in showers for Fort Nelson, 16 in showers for Smithers and Prince George. Dawson City, 20 degrees in cloud, 21 in sunshine for Old Crow. Wrigley, 18 in showers, Trout Lake and Fort Leard, both 25 showers expected there. Sunshine for the northern NWT, Tuck Tuck, Tuck 11, Colville Lake, 16. New York, sunshine and 9 degrees, RV at 9 as well, sunny skies. Key night, 11 and sunny. Pangerton and Clyde River, both 8 degrees with sunshine.
The Fort Mackay First Nation in northern Alberta held their first Treaty Day celebration in person since 2019. And APTN's Chris Stewart was there. He brings us some of the goings on for the three day event. I turn back the years. The 2022 Fort Mackay Treaty Days has been three years in the making. With COVID having stopped in-person celebrations, now the community has a chance to meet up again. Trade stories face-to-face -face and take part in a multitude of events. Chris Johnson is the CEO of the Fort Mackay First Nation. We've got three days full of festivities. We've got uh, canoe races, fish fries, bannock making, um, yeah, we're opening ourselves up back to back out to uh, you know the community, and we've got um, all of our friends from McMurray coming in. We've got a great turnout here. It's okay. So if you pinch it, do that. There were archery lessons and demonstrations, a softball tournament, hot meals, music, and dancing. Conservative Member of Parliament Layla Goodrich was here to volunteer and help out. She says being back in person is needed after three years of not having the celebrations where you can see and touch each other. Especially now after we've had a couple years of not being able to connect with one another, being able to get together, being able to uh, break bread and share stories is just so incredibly important. Uh, it's been wonderful. Those who attended had a great time. Excellent food, excellent entertainment. Uh, a lot of people came, so yeah. So and there's gonna be a concert, so they'll probably be filled up tonight. It was really fun. I really enjoyed the Fear Factor, and it was really gross, but really fun because I won and I like winning. Stephanie Harp is a singer and is from Fort Mackay. She performed on stage Saturday evening along with Streetheart and Big Wreck. Harp says there's no feeling like being back home. Oh yeah, lots of visits, uh, lots of visits, lots of love. So I'm just, uh, I'm just feeling so good being home. I just, uh, any chance I get, um, it's nice to be back. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Fort Mackay, Alberta. That is good to see, and we are looking forward to seeing all of your posts on social media of Treaty Days as they're back in person, finally. Well, that is a wrap on your news to kick off the week, but I'm going to leave you with some highlights from Indigenous Day Live this past weekend. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night.